Think scaling AI is hard? Think again. With Watson X, you can deploy AI across any environment. Above the clouds, helping pilots navigate flights, and on lots of clouds, helping employees automate tasks. On-prem, so designers can access proprietary data, and on the edge, so remote bank tellers can assist customers. Watson X works anywhere, so you can scale AI everywhere. Learn more at ibm.com slash WatsonX. IBM. Let's create. Before the closure of the Oregon College of Oriental Medicine last month, Portland was the home of two of the most prestigious alternative medicine schools in the country. But in recent years, alternative medicine degrees have been on the radar of consumer protection watchdogs because students routinely take on hundreds of thousands of dollars in debt and then graduate into a world where they're earning a sliver of what they'd need to pay back those loans. In fact, both Portland alternative medicine schools I mentioned are in the top three for graduating students with the highest levels of debt relative to their earning of all graduate programs in the country. So today on CityCast Portland, I'm talking with OPB higher education reporter Tiffany Kamhai about the financial challenges facing these graduates, why some are accusing the schools of predatory behavior, and just what it says about the state of naturopathic medicine. It's Tuesday, September 24th. I'm Claudia Meza, and this is what Portland's talking about. Can you define what we're talking about when we say naturopathic medicine? Like, do you mean like acupuncturists, herbalists, people with crystals? Like what, what visual should people get? Mm, Okay. Um, People with crystals. There are going to be some people that take issue with that, (laughs) when you combine that with naturopathy and acupuncture. Mm -hmm. But yeah, naturopathic medicine basically means people who believe that the body can heal itself, and it is licensed in Oregon and in a lot of other states, it's regulated. More modern naturopathic doctors, they're trained in in some like traditional medicine, like when I say traditional, I mean like Western Mm -hmm. methods, like you know, you're going to go to Kaiser and and see your primary care doctor, that type of stuff. But then they also um, focus on like whole body healing. So you come in and you're like, I'm having migraines all the time. They'll be like, all right, well, what's going on in your life? Like, are you Mm -hmm. really stressed out at work? What are you eating? Are you exercising? So they're kind of like looking at everything around you um, instead of like prescribing ibuprofen immediately. Yeah, it's like a more holistic approach is what I'm hearing. Exactly, yes, yeah. Well, you've reported that the National University of Natural Medicine, or NUNM, and the Oregon College of Oriental Medicine, OCOM, are some of the most prestigious schools of this kind in the country. But there are more. So, like, what sets them apart from all the other schools? Well, it's partly that they've been around for a long time. Um, So they're among the first schools to educate and graduate acupuncturists and naturopathic doctors. So just the fact that they've been around for a long time and people know them, that kind of like gave them some prestige. Um, What are they learning there? Like I'm assuming in order to be called like a doctor, because they're called doctors, right? Naturopathic doctors, yes. Acupuncturists, no. So are they learning the same kind of thing that you would learn when you get your MD? Yeah. Same stuff, right? A medical degree? Yeah. Uh, Similar. Mm. So they're learning some of the things that you would learn in a traditional medicine school. But for acupuncturists specifically, they're learning needling techniques. They're learning traditional Chinese medicine. So like Chinese herbs, what herb to use if you're having chronic headaches. They're also doing this thing that I heard from students that went there that's like, cultivating their spirit in their practice. That is like an important thing for um, Mm -hmm. acupuncturists and traditional Chinese medicine, naturopathic doctors. And they do have things like clinic hours. They have to meet a certain amount of hours before they can um, graduate. And they're also getting some business classes. Like this is how you run your own naturopathic clinic, your own acupuncture clinic. Yeah. Well, so I know that this form of medicine is really like a lot of people's last hope when they have certain kinds of like 
uh, hard to diagnose ailments where Western medicine is just like, I don't know, you're depressed. I don't know. <laughs> you know. Uh, so I know that there is a demand for this type of medicine. So why did the Oregon College of Oriental Medicine or OCOM close? Uh, yeah, the simple answer is that they couldn't balance their expenses. The school cost a lot of money to run and enrollment was declining and has been declining um, mm. among that school for a really long time. OCOM relies on student tuition to balance its budget. I was looking at their 990 tax forms. Um, I think it was something like 80% of their revenue came from student tuition. So the fact that their enrollment has been declining for so long, um, it just didn't balance out. <laughs> it, wasn't yeah. gonna, it wasn't gonna work out for them. Yeah, and a lot of your reporting does hinge on the school debt to income ratio. Mm -hmm. And you're reporting that these schools are two of the top three worst in the country when it comes to that debt to income ratio. Like even worse than uh, poetry, MFA graduates <laughs> is what I'm hearing. Worse than uh, getting an arts degree at Columbia University or a film degree, I think. Oh, yeah. But it's up yeah. there. There's is, theirs is up there too. <laughs> <laughs> well, like, can you explain what you mean that by that? Like, you know, so they're coming out, they have all this debt and they just can't make the money back. Like, is that as simple as, as that or is there something more to it? Yeah, pretty close to what you're saying. They're they're taking out a lot of money um, in student loans to finance their education, but they will never be able to pay those loans off because what they're making in their careers after graduation is so low. It's just it just that also is another thing that doesn't balance out. Mm -hmm. So the students that I talked to were like, "Well, the enrollment has been de declining because the word is getting out." that we're taking out hundreds of thousands of dollars in student loans, then graduating and making twenty to $30,000 four years after graduation. That's less than a high school graduate. Yeah. And, they're gra and they're graduating with, mas like I said, master's uh, degrees, doctorate's degrees. So these students are saying, we were misled by these schools mm. because they were um, you know, cherry-picking information to give to us during the admissions process. Like, oh, mm -hmm. so that's because I was going to ask, like, well, what do they think they were getting into? You know, we all know college mm -hmm. is expensive, especially graduate school. And with all the conversation in the past few years uh, about this very type of debt, you know, like student loan debt. Yeah. Yeah. I was I was confused when students were just like, what? You know, after they enrolled. But if they're being fed incorrect information, that's very different. <laughs> that's yeah, very, yeah, exactly. That's like, that is the big difference between like the film degree from Columbia University or like the music degree that you get from somewhere. Mm -hmm. But a lot of people know, like, I'm going to be paying a lot of money for this degree and then it's going to be very hard <laughs> to be <laughs> successful. And like, I'm willing to take that risk or like, you know, I want to do this so much. These students that were going to NUNM and OCOM, also very passionate about these holistic forms of medicine. They want to help people. But they were saying, you know, the staff at these schools were telling them, this is a growing field. There's going to be lots of jobs for you. People want this medicine, which is true in Portland, at least among the groups that I hang out with. People are always talking about their acupuncturist, their massage. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like it's a thing here on the West Coast in Portland, especially. And they were leaving out salary information, yeah. what kind of work they would be getting into. The students I talked to thought that they would be able to get like a nine to five job with benefits. But in reality, the majority of these graduates are uh, doing contract work. They're basically like freelancers jobs with like no benefits. Um, they have to build up their own business. And that is just not what they thought it was going to be. Like the staff at these schools were telling them you're going to be doctors. But you know, when people hear you're going to be a doctor, you think six figures salary. 
Yeah. This is so, at this, the very least, right? <laughs> right? Well, yeah. <laughs> well, not only that, Tiffany, like, I don't understand how these jobs in this field is so low paying because it appears like their services are not cheap. It's not like you're going in and they're like 20 bucks and they're popping needles in you. Like, it's really expensive, just the copay alone. So I'm, I don't understand that math. Like, how are their services so expensive, but they're not making any money? Yeah, that's a great question. I did ask about that, and they were telling me that it has to do with low insurance reimbursements. So, well, the the fact that insurance covers this type of medicine at all is like, they were just saying, that's great. Mm -hmm. We love that. Because 10 years ago, that wasn't the case. But insurers, they get to set the rates, and they've been paying like half of what the rates have been set at. That's what I've been told. I haven't really looked into it that much. The other problem is that like this form of medicine is still something that is not really accepted here in the U.S. What do you mean? Yet. So, well, I mean, so these students thought that hospital systems and healthcare clinics were going to be hiring them, but they're not. Mm -hmm. And I think like to the like, why is it more expensive? So when you're going to a naturopathic doctor, they're like, um, it's probably their own clinic. They have to pay the rent for whatever. They have to pay for like a staff person to do all those like insurance claims. And then they have to kind of like make up the difference. So that's why. <laughs> yeah. That's why it's costly because they're just trying to like make a living. Yeah. All right. Well, let's take a quick break here. And when we come back, the response from these schools to the financial realities of their graduates. October is Dining Month in Vancouver, Washington, and they're calling it Dine the Couve. And participating restaurants are offering a $33 special menu featuring three items. Now, these can range from the more traditional offerings like an appetizer, entree, and dessert to three specially made plates, or my favorite so far, two glasses of wine and a charcuterie board. For 33 bucks in this economy, I'll take it. You can download the free mobile friendly pass starting September 26th, and that's where you can find the list of participating restaurants, their special Dine the Coof menus, addresses, and all that. Plus, if you use the pass to make five check ins at participating locations throughout the month of October, you'll be eligible for a grand prize drawing. You can find the link to download the pass and all other information at dinethecoof.com. How do stop losses work on Kraken? Let's say I have a birthday party on Wednesday night, but an important meeting Thursday morning. So sensible me pre-books a taxi for 10 p.m. with alerts. Voila, I won't be getting carried away and staying out till two. That's stop loss orders on Kraken, an easy way to plan ahead. Go to kraken.com and see what crypto can be. Not investment advice. Crypto trading involves risk of loss. Cryptocurrency services are provided to U.S. and U.S. territory customers by Payward Interactive Inc., PWI, DBA Kraken. View PWI's disclosures at kraken.com slash legal slash disclosures. How have the staff at these schools responded? I'm sure they're they're not in the dark about the financial realities that their graduates are facing. Were you able to speak to any of the staff and be like, yo, what's up with this? And did you ask it just like that? Yo, what's up with this? I didn't ask um, that question verbatim, uh, mm -hmm. but <laughs> I did. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I asked a similar question saying, you know, you're uh, you have a bunch of graduates who are, are not making a lot of money. There's U.S. Department of Education data showing how much federal loans they took out and then how much they're making four years after graduation. And I talked to the presidents of OCOM and NUNM. Well, I didn't actually speak to NUNM. We had a back and forth email conversation. But, you know, they, they are aware. Yes, they are aware that this is happening and they say they're doing what they can to set up their graduates for success. They're offering these business classes. They are committed to transparency with costs and they are helping them with career opportunities. So what I'm hearing is that they're just basically just saying words back. Like, yeah, of course, you know, we're helping. But that doesn't mean that they're answering why they're cherry picking information and giving these students false hope. Did they say anything about that? Did you say what's up with that, dog? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> 
<laughs> Did you ask that? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I got similar answers. You yeah. know, we have like alumni surveys, and that's true that uh, NUNM has like alumni surveys that some students shared with me, and it showed that you know the students were making like I think NUNM survey said their graduates were making between forty and fifty thousand, which is higher than the. Um, yeah, that's still not a lot. It's you made a face. Good. Yeah, that's not good. <laughs> I love the like. Wait, hold on. <laughs> our our graduates are not making thirty thousand. Okay, they're making forty to fifty. It's just like, yeah, what? they still won't oh. be able to pay off their student loans. But then there's interest on these student loans. So I talked to students who took out, you know, a hundred thousand dollars in two thousand seven because of compounding interest. They now owe three hundred thousand dollars. Oh, I talked, oh. and I know, I know. It makes your brain hurt. I talked to OCOM graduates who graduated last month Mm -hmm. in August. They're starting out with $300,000 in loans. What? Why? Why did it get so expensive? That's a great question that the presidents could not answer. Well, what recourse do the students with these crushing debt loads have? Because I know, you know, the Biden administration has been talking a big game about loan forgiveness. Mm-hmm. And I know a lot of art students. I know like there was a art institute. Oh yeah. Art institutes. Yes. Yeah. Like they yes. got like a lot of the students. I, mm-hmm. I I have friends who went to the art institute and they're just like, yeah, they cleared our loan because they mm-hmm. realized it was a scam. Uh, yes. Is this something that maybe might happen here, especially since OCOM closed? Like- yeah. Short answer is maybe with a bunch of question marks. Mm. So yeah, the Art Institute's case that you're talking about, um, those students got their loans discharged through a federal program called Borrower Defense to Repayment. Um, And it's like it sounds. Like, if you can prove that your school scammed you, your school misled you into taking out a bunch of loans to the federal government, then the federal government will discharge those loans. Um, Borrower's defense is very different than that Biden's administration plan to like forgive student loans like that. It's a different thing. This is like a a consumer protection. I was about to say, this seems more like a consumer protection measure. Yeah. So Mm -hmm. if they're able to prove that, then then perhaps they're. Yes. And so do you have you spoken to students or some of them? you know, yeah. going down that road. A- almost all the students that I quoted in the stories are, have applied or are planning to apply to borrower defense. It's not like a, it's not a simple application. It's like mm-hmm. 20 pages. You have to describe how the school misled you. And like the more specific you can be, like if you like even know like the financial aid officer's name, like you're willing to call people out. But some of these people took out loans 20 years ago. Oh. Um, so, <laughs> so they're just like, I don't know, Billy, right. Bob, I don't know. Right. Oh, man. Yeah. So and then you have to like also say like, this is how it's negatively affected my life. That application goes to the U.S. Department of Education. Someone there takes a look at it and approves it or disapproves of it. The thing with borrower's defense, there's a backlog of 700,000 applications right now. So these students, they've applied, but they're at the end of that line. Um, and with like the staff that the Department of Education has right now, you know, these these students and these applications may not be a priority for a while. The other wrench that you can throw in is that all of this student consumer protection stuff could go out the window depending on which administration take shape in January, Mm. depending on the election, the presidential election. Right. Well, being that like we're so close to basically just calling this whole thing a scam, what does that say about naturopathic medicine in general? Is it too much of a stretch to say that the whole industry is just as unsustainable if costs of education are this high and, and practitioners are having so much trouble getting paid? Does this mean like uh, it's on the way out? Is that safe to say? Or like, w- w- you know, I'm sure this was a question that was asked yeah. amongst these people, you know? Yeah, it's like a huge discussion in the naturopathy field and the acupuncture field right now. They're wrestling with this. Um, I know a lot of people are concerned 
Mm-hmm. OCOM is just the latest school to close down because it couldn't balance its expenses. There was a school in Austin that shut down um, recently, a school in San Francisco. And most of these schools have mm-hmm. a really high debt to earnings ratio. If you like, look at the top 10 at that US Department of Education data, eight out of 10 are alternative medicine schools mm-hmm. with, the, with the highest debt to earnings ratio. I think people in this field are, you know, reckoning with the, f- the fact that, you know, they have like these highly trained graduates that are making no money. And then they're eventually just like leaving because like they can't make a living mm-hmm. on it anymore. So I think, yeah, it's something that a lot of people are worried about. Like, I know some people are saying we need to do more advocacy work for, you know, medical boards just making this type of medicine more accepted and something mm-hmm. that insurance companies will actually, you know, pay 100%. <laughs> but they're not paying 100% for almost anything. That's you true. Know? The way I see it is like our our medical system is already broken. And then you try to add one more thing on it and it's like the thing that can't fit because it's like, look, we're barely functioning as is. We can't pay an herbalist now. <laughs> <You know? laughs> like they're just like, there's no room here for you. So I can, you know, to me, it just like speaks of the, the wider issue oh, that yeah. we have. But yeah, yeah, I for one, I didn't know that Portland was home to these institutions, that they were so prestigious and that they were crumbling. <laughs> I had, you know, yeah. so this was, this was an enlightening story. And I will say that there are some schools out there that are graduating acupuncturists and their graduates have no debt. There's one school here in Portland called Poca Tech. Um, and that was it's called Poca Tech. Yeah, it sounds like you're poking someone. Like, oh my God, it could have been Sir Poke a lot. That would be my acupuncture school. Uh huh. It's an acronym. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I thought it was like Poca <laughs> You're like, no, you sweet, sweet lamb. <laughs> it's not. I- I can't remember off the top of my head what it stands for, but it's like <laughs> just drove anyway, us off the road. The, there. There's like this. There's this school, Pocatech, and it was founded by a graduate of OCOM um, and a few other people actually. And I talked to the founder of that school, and you know, she saw this problem, you know, 10, 15 years ago, and she was like, "I just wanted to come up with like a solution to this." So, Pocatech is, uh, I think, a three- to four-year program. It costs $25,000, but students cannot take out federal student loans. Wow. So that's why they're graduating with no debt. But they also just, if you don't have, like, twenty five twenty five thousand dollars right? <laughs> Yeah. But um, she didn't want any of the students to graduate with, like, this crippling debt, which mm-hmm. she saw years ago. So it's a semi-solution. Yeah. <laughs> <That's> just, a, <laughs> just have money is the solution. <laughs> so Polka Tech, it's People's Organization of Community Acupuncture. Thank you. Yeah. Well, thank you, Tiffany, for walking us through your, you know, series of stories about this. I mean, it was news to me. I'm sure it's going to be news to a lot of people. And I, I know there's a lot of people who listen to our show who are part of the health mm. uh, industry. And I'm, oh, sh- I'm and I w- just wonder if they're just like, what? I, great. <laughs> you know? Oh, yeah. I'm, they, they might know. I hope I said everything correctly then. Oh, um, we'll I, hear about it if you didn't. Don't worry. Oh, <laughs> yeah, I know. I will, too. I'm sure I'll get emails about how I worded something wrong. So I welcome those, everyone. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks again, <laughs> Tiffany. All right. Thanks, Claudia. That's all for today here on CityCast Portland. Thanks so much for listening. If you enjoyed the show, please share it with a friend, rate, or leave us a review. It really does help us out. We'll be back tomorrow morning with more from around the city. Until then, see you at Slim's.